It's project time. Now, regulars to the live stream channel, yes, there is a live stream channel called Big Clive Live, uh, will be familiar with the supercomputers, which are basically panels in the background. Well, let me turn the light off there. It looks like a sci-fi supercomputer. Light coming back, watch your eyes. Uh, the live stream channel, incidentally, imagine a pub table with over a thousand technical people at it at the weekend. It's the conversation is sometimes a bit risk. Just so you know that it's not like it's not all happy fun fun like this channel. Well, it is happy fun fun, but in a very different direction. Uh, however, we have the supercomputer panels on that uh, are in the background all the time. This is basically just a matrix of self-flashing LEDs. If I turn this off and on again, uh, they'll all be in sync and they'll flash on and off together, but then they'll gradually go out of sync. And that's all there is to it. It's got resistors in series to limit the current and keep the power sensible and also the intensity down, because otherwise it would be mega bright. However, this project... Excuse me, getting rid of this out of the way here. This project... I thought I'd make a supercomputer LED lamp using one of the many lamp kits that are available from eBay. And what you get when you buy one of these kits is, you well, eBay and AliExpress. AliExpress might be a better option these days. But what you get is a circuit board for the LEDs, a bare power supply that you put the components on yourself, the housing with just a couple of wires sticking out, and then a usually extremely tight-fitting dome that goes over the front and holds everything in place. You can also get kits with the LEDs, but, uh, well, even without the LEDs, it works out more expensive than just buying an LED lamp, but it's fun to build, although it does require mains voltage experience, not recommended for people who are new to electronic assembly. The power supply has most of the component values marked on it, and I'll show you the schematic of this, because that will make things a bit easier. Because there's also a limitation. The schematic looks like this. Let's zoom down it. It has the power supply capacitor, a dropper capacitor. In this case, it's one microfarad, which is huge. I'll be downsizing that for lower current. It has a 470k resistor across it. It has a discrete bridge rectifier based on what looked like 1N4007 diodes. Are they 1N4007? 1N4007 they are. It's got a 400 volt death beam, 4.7 microfarad capacitor, a 200k resistor across that, which heaven help it if the LEDs go open circuit because uh, that resistor will then dissipate twice its rating. And then bizarrely, this 10 ohm resistor here, this resistor here, should really actually be down here, but they put it over there. I might put it in line and just use a different resistor there. But then the LEDs, because of the huge number of them, uh, 120 in this case, They've got them wired either as pairs, or in this case, triplets of LEDs in parallel. Uh, I've not even drawn in my wee dinky arrows to indicate that they're exploding with light. But what I'm going to have to do here, I'd love to put all flashing LEDs in this, but that's not going to work, because the, the flashing LEDs tend to go open circuit when they're off. And if they did that, the voltage across them would fly up really high. And when they turned on again, it could cause a current pulse from this capacitor. So what I'm going to have to do, is populate all the middle LEDs with just fixed uh, static LEDs. And I've tested this. I've got some LEDs and I plug them into my little LED tester like this. Now, normally when I buy my LEDs, I buy a big bag of a thousand because uh, that way you get matched LEDs. In this case, they didn't. It was like they basically took two handfuls of LEDs from different sources and put them in one bag. That is very annoying. But the plan is, crinkle, crinkle, that I will get one static LED like this, and then across that will be two flashing ones, and the static one will cap the voltage. Now, it's important here to try the LEDs you choose in advance, because uh, if the if you used a red LED here, it would cap the voltage to 2 volts and these would not light. So you have to use an LED with a very similar voltage or a slightly higher voltage. So you have to experiment. You can see when the other ones come on, the current limiting one dips. So now let's start building it. So the first thing I'm doing here, I've looked at the circuit board. 
it's double sided and it's got pads on both sides. I could have done this with a single sided board, but I've followed the track side round and I've put a dot uh, in the middle of each cluster of three LEDs. And now I'm going to solder one of these LEDs into each of those positions. And then I'll probably build the power supply as well. And then I'll test it just to see initially if that uh, smattering of LEDs lights up. So I'm going to do that now. One moment, please. So I'm starting the power supply and I have initially cropped the leads down a little bit, not fully. I'll be cropping them further, but just to make it easier to gain access for soldering, I've put the components in and I've put a bit of sellotape across the back to hold them in place so I can solder more at once instead of just doing one at a time. So now I'm going to wipe the tip of the solder and make sure it's clean and shiny. And I'm going to start soldering this. And it's not going to take too long. I'm going to solder all the one end of uh, a row of components first and then go to the other side just because it helps uh, let the heat dissipate from the component. I've already swapped one component. I've already chosen another capacitor. I'm going to use 220 nanofarad for the current limiter just because I want the current to be lower. So let's just um, start soldering the other side now. Then I shall pause while I put the LEDs into the uh, round circuit board, just because that is going to take quite some time. I'm tempted to initially put just the static white LEDs in and then test it with this power supply first to see if it lights up okay, which is quite good that I'm using a lower value capacitor for that. So that's those components soldered in. And I can crop those leads. Tape comes off. And I should just crop these willy-nilly. These snips, although they're blunt at the tip, are fine for cropping components because it's just the tip that is blunt owing to the fact that I misuse them, as I sometimes do to cut stuff that was inappropriate. Now, this capacitor, make sure we get it in the right way because otherwise it will go kaboom. Uh, so this is the negative going... That's the positive, the two bands pointing in, so that's a positive there. So I'm going to initially fold the leads over like this. Then place it through the circuit board and solder that. So I'll solder one lead initially and just check its positioning before I solder the other one. Don't want to put too much pressure on the leads of a electrolytic capacitor. Let the solder cool. I'm using lead-based solder. Controversial. Oh, it's dangerous. Everybody's going to die. What about the babies? Etc. Yes. It's the bit that makes solder flow better and malleable, which is good for solder. It means it doesn't break so easily and grow tin whiskers. There's so a whole science behind solder that was just thrown out the window by people with strong views. Right, this capacitor, they've got plenty of positions for the capacitor. So I'm going to put it in there. And there, I may change this capacitor out afterwards. It's just a real, initially a test. To avoid strain the capacitor, I'm going to back it off the circuit board a wee bit, lift it off and solder one of the leads. Actually, you know what? I might actually tilt it back like that and lay it across the other components. That'd be quite nice, wouldn't it? It would have been quite nice. It looks quite smart. And it'll be easier to get a bit of heat shrink across because I don't want to just have this circuit board rattling loose in the uh, inside the light in case it touches the back of the LED circuit board and goes kaboom and all my good work disappears in a puff of smoke. That's looking good. Right, next stop, the LED circuit board. One moment, please. I am cheating just a tiny bit. I've got a PCB assembly frame. I think it's made by iCell. Not sure where you'd get one of these from. But once you've put the components in from the other side, it holds it in place while you solder them in without having to do it one by one, because otherwise, you know, it would take a lot of time. So I'm going to solder one pin of each LED at a time. Now, they've got square pins, uh, square pads, I say, to indicate the positive terminal and round pins to indicate the negative terminal. So I'm starting the positive terminal just because, well, it's... A random choice. It also has an advantage that uh, if it needs a reworked, if it needs realigned, uh, by soldering the positive first, it's the one with the little leg up the side of the anvil that holds the chip, so it means the chip gets exposed to less 
heat this way. But anyway, this is going to be a very time-consuming bit of the project, so I shall pause momentarily until this is all soldered, and then once it's soldered, we can test it initially without the flashing LEDs just to see if the white LEDs are going to light. I should say that I've already thought of something different. These are in multiples of three in parallel all the way around. If you marked it as the clusters of three in parallel, you could have positioned it so the flashing LEDs were more interspersed because at the moment it's forming stripes of the fixed LEDs. But uh, it's just the only way to discover things like this is to make one. But anyway, I shall pause momentarily and we'll see it once the LEDs have been sorted in. One moment, please. Testing time, and to make it more realistic, I have not tested this. I thought I'd start the video again before I did it, just in case everything goes horribly wrong, because then it gets caught in video. So, I have tapped the connections on here. Just double-checking right now, they are absolutely correct. Uh, let me just check. Yeah, it looks all right. Um, I've got my little power supply thing. I've put the little inline 10-ohm resistor... Uh, and a new series resistor with uh, to replace that 10 ohm one. I put a 470 ohm resistor in. Let's test it and see if it lights or goes bang. It is lit. This is good. And they've all lit, so I've put them all in the right way around. The power is 1.2 watts, which is going to be good, perfect for the uh, supercomputer type thing. Uh, 14 milliamps AC, power factor is 0 0.357, 0 0.36. Uh, it's... Fine. It's just what you'd expect for a simple capacitive dropper circuit like this. Okay, time to put in all the flashing LEDs now. One moment, please. The other LEDs have been sorted in. Let's put the leads on and test this. So the middle connection is positive. This is not plugged in at the moment. I just thought I'd mention that, although it should be. Well, it's not always obvious. Sometimes I do the weirdest things. So positive in there. Negative to the outer connection. I will be sleeving this in a bit of heat shrink, this power supply. I'll put that there. Is it going to work? Let's see how the power's changed as well. The power may fluctuate up and down a little bit. Is that on properly? That's on. Fine. Okay. I shall bring in the hoppy again. Where is the hoppy? There is the hoppy. I could also use the anti, but the hoppy has a slightly brighter display. The anti is better at weird capacitance loads, though. So, what are we getting? Three, two, one. Oh, a couple haven't lit. Oh, no, they have lit. They're just, uh, some didn't light initially. Yeah, that's fine. Hold on, I've got to turn it off. Oh, not again. Why didn't the other ones light up? Oh, they have now. So, now we have... Right, tell you what, I'll zoom in in this. I shall zoom in in it, um, nudge it in with a pen, change the exposure slightly. Uh, hold on, I'm just going to uh, expose right into the middle of this. Oh, that's better. Oh, that's slightly flickery, the look of it. Uh, that could do with a bigger capacitor on the power supply. But here is our super computer. It looks all right. Takes you a second to spot the LEDs that aren't flashing just because it is rather chaotic. Uh, power consumption, let's uh, squish this to the side. I'll, I'll zoom back out again and uh, brighten up the exposure. Bring in Zappi. And we can take a look at the power. The power is uh, 14 milliamps, 1.26 watts. That's really good, isn't it? Just over a watt for the supercomputer lamp. Uh, 0.356 power factor. It's bouncing up and down a bit, right enough. Okie dokie. Right. I shall unplug it, put the sleeve over, stick the circuit board in, clip the lid on, and we'll see what the final product looks like. One moment, please. And there we have it. The 120 LED, of which 80 are flashing, supercomputer lamp, uh, looking very bright to the human eye. It's tamed down for the camera. Also, that flicker is very notable. It would just blur out if I uh, turned the brightness up. But uh, it's showing at 1.26 watts, roughly, uh, power consumption on the Chinese power supply meter. That thing down there. Hold on, hold on. That thing. 
Uh, so that's a success. That's not bad. It's a very interesting and unusual lamp. Another option here where you could use... Uh, Actually, how would that work with three in parallel colour changing LEDs? You could do that, but when any particular one was at red, it might hog the current a bit, pull the volts down. Uh, but having said that, this is an interesting result. Looks good to me. And you can't really see too easily the LEDs that aren't flashing. It just gives the impression you still get the sort of chaotic patterns. So I would say that's a good result. Well worth doing.